And thanks to Corinna and Kirill and you to organizing this great event and also for inviting me to, to speak. And it's at the beginning, it's important to mention I co-wrote this commentary with Trevor Wilson. So it's very much a collaborative work and he can't be there because he's speaking about Ilyenkov, but on another event. So he's in Chicago and he speaks about the encyclopedia. So it's a shame he can't be here, um, but I will try to present our work as best as I can. And if I can't answer your question, I have a good excuse why I can't answer them. So as Sasha already said, um, I'm giving a summary of a summary of a commentary that we co-wrote for his book, Cosmos and Praxis, which I think we're all looking forward to. And I'm curious about the book launch later. And um, the commentary is um, devoted to a 1955 article that Ilyenkov wrote for Vaprosi Philosophy. And um, we also prepared an English translation of this article. And for those of you who haven't had the chance to read my paper, it's basically, to put it very briefly, it's, it has two parts. So the first is a broader historical investigation of the context surrounding the appearance of Yankov's essay. So the Soviet thaw period and also the institutional and intellectual networks in the Soviet Union of the 1950s. And we're especially framing Ilyenkov's essay, both in a broader context of trends in the Soviet Union, especially a Hegelian revival, and then also Ilyenkov's intellectual encounters. So we're focusing on um, his reading of Lukács and how his discovery and translation of um, Lukács' book about the young Hegel shaped his, um, the development of his ideas, which he, um, which you can very much see in, in the essay. And um, another focus is on a very close reading, not necessarily in regards to his later work, but we, we take this essay also, also as a transitional piece um, in its own right. So as a major work of Ilyenkov in its very own right. And this is why the second part of our commentary is a close reading where we try to figure out some main constellations, um, which is, of course, the notion of conscious materialism, then his early understanding and formation of concreteness and the dialectic of concreteness, and also um, the idea of social interconnectedness or interconnectivity. And um, when I prepared um, my, my paper for, for this conference, I looked at the commentary again and found quite an interesting idea about development, which I uh, will share with you. I put it in the chat as well. Um, it gives a good idea of the um, direction of the essay more generally. So he writes a Yankov towards the very end of his essay. He writes that it is a general characteristic of dialectics to not have a reductive point of view which is a purely analytical dismembering of an object into its composite parts, but rather vice versa, an inferential uh, point of view. So what he calls vividenia, a point of view of genetic development. And um, the example he gives in the essay, which I also quote in the paper, is that of a rabbit. And the idea that we cannot understand what a rabbit is or this complexity um, of, of its wholeness, of its totality, of concrete parts, if we merely disassemble it and um, analyze the individual parts as abstract entities. But there's a certain idea of developmental understanding which works from the complexity, both from the complexity to simplicity and the other way around. And I think that's also what makes the essay so interesting is his ideas are in a slightly earlier stage. For instance, the ascent from the abstract to the concrete is described more in a kind of interconnected or multi-directional process. And um, I think it, to read this essay today, maybe it might change our perspective also on ideas of development, ideas of consciousness, and also um, the formation of his notion of concreteness. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, 
Um, there are no immediate questions. Uh, I would ask, uh, uh, pertaining to what you said uh, last, um, that the notion of uh, concrete is quite uh, prominent in, in the paper and in the whole idea of dialectics, of course. But uh, what's with the abstract? Uh, it, is it only a kind of um, is it is it only a, a, a starting point for for the inquiry into concreteness, or is it also something uh, on its own in its own right, so to say? Does it have its systematic place? I think. Um... It's a very interesting question because I think if we look at Ilyenkov's um, notion of concreteness, we, we could be tempted to think he completely rejects abstract thinking. But what we argue in the essay is that his return to Hegel or his acquaintance with Hegelian texts, and I'm thinking, for instance, about who thinks abstractly by Hegel, where Hegel really makes us aware how, Im how important abstraction is for concrete thought and how important the interrelation is between the two. And I think in this article, Ienko follows Hegel very closely and describes also the crucial role of abstraction, not as something which is to be rejected, but as a sig that also a, a signifier of logical and scientific thought. Thanks. Um, Maxime also had a question. Please, Maxime. Yeah, thanks. Uh... Isabel, thank you for yeah. your interest, interest paper and uh, interest speech. And uh, my question uh, goes like this. Uh, for Marx and for Ilyankov, there was no Marxist ontology. A uh, student of Ilyankov, Sergei Mareev, put it sharply. Marxist ontology is just like Marxist alchemy. Ilyankov stood on the Lenin's position. Dialectics is the logic and the theory of knowledge of Hegel and Marxism. You do not even need three different words, not just three different sciences. For Marx, also the political economy is the real ontology. What do you mean by Marxist ontology? Thank you. Could you understand, Isabel? Yeah, I think I could understand. So what is, what is meant by Marxist ontology and what, what we mean by Marxist ontology, do we use this term? I, I can't even remember. Maybe we do. Um, I think you're absolutely right. I think we can, I mean, th there's this whole investigation at the beginning of uh, Ilyenkov's commentary as well as what is he actually speaking about? Is he speaking about epistemology or what he calls nauseology? And he says, in a way, he also opposes his own position against a classical Soviet orthodox understanding of nauseology or epistemology and there's two parallel lines of thought to which he applies his argument one is a theory of mind we could call it a theory of mind or a theory of consciousness the other one is um economics and in a way these two parallel strange strains maybe come together in his book on capital and probably he wouldn't call it an ontology, but I think it's definitely more than a simple philosophy of mind, or if we use these categories, it's definitely an all-encompassing theory of reality and, and also dialectic, dialectical logic reflected and enacted through reality. So maybe justify to call it an ontology, like uh, conscious materialism. Thanks. Maybe also in terms of a social ontology, right? Mm. Very complicated uh, and contradictory this uh, concept. Uh, Corinna, you had a question. Yeah, you want to share? No, um, maybe you can come here, Kushi. And uh, Isa, uh, people know where to go. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 Isabel, hello. <laughs> Thanks for your contribution. Uh, I just, I was just looking at your paper and also in relation to what you've just said and that uh, uh, relation to ontology as well. Um, I just thought you, you say Marx's version of Hegelian dialectics was peculiarly invested in the interconnectedness of ideal and material realities, which uh, of course it was, is absolutely true. And then that 
thinking is directly emerging from the actual concrete life processes. Well, with there, I, I, I would, um, I think that needs to be qualified. Both of those statements really need to be qualified because um, it wasn't only the interconnectedness of ideal and material processes, but the dialectical contradiction between them, which is not the same as it's part, it has to be interconnected in order to be contradictory. But if we leave that out, then it becomes more of an evolutionary emerging rather than a dialectic. And I think uh, in Jacob's whole dialectical logic, all his production from the period, the early period when you're discussing this first essay, is uh, it, it has this content, which is often, I think, very much elided um, in, in commentaries. And, and um, I don't know what this word efflux of material I've never heard that expression. I don't know what it means, efflux. But um, this, this it's, done, it's not a direct, it is both direct and indirect, the relationship with the material and the ideal. I think that's what Ilyenko was always struggling with, that this is a big question, and it's not, there's no easy answers. And that's why he struggled with it. And I think the whole, you know, this moment you, you focus on is very important, this first essay, which I had, I don't, you know, I don't know how much of many people have been able to read that, but it was obviously just immediately from the period that David has focused on this explosion in 55, 56, after the death of, of, of Stalin, of course, and that, you know, this connection between the philosophical renaissance and struggle, incredible struggle and courage, and the political changes that were transforming not only the Soviet Union, but globally, the whole global situation. And then now we have, this links up with Mikhail's contribution, that this whole global phenomenon that he was working as a part of. Very, very interesting questions. And also thanks for the, for the feedback. Um, I think there are a couple of things to unpick. So first you bring up the difference between a mere interconnectedness of this totality and then the idea of there is actually a struggle or dialectic, dialectic contradiction, which is quite a different type of logic operating. And um, I think it's an interesting point. And it's also maybe a good entry into the article, because when we read it, we had the impression there was actually a point where Yankov strongly flirted with a kind of Hegelian um, almost teleological um, conception while also sharply criticizing it and trying to find his own position towards this kind of understanding of history. And um, there are two, almost on a linguistic level, there's, there are terms he uses like ascension or deduction, which are almost suggesting a more linear or teleological understanding of how we um, create knowledge from, from our um, experience and and the other thing which is going on is uh, maybe the formation of a more dialectical logic for which he would become famous in his later works this which is always already this signature Ilyenkov but there's also still this more Hegelian um, linguistics going on in the article and as, as, as such as an it's an interesting document of um, being exposed to these ideas, rejecting them, commenting on them, and then maybe reaching his own standpoint. This is how I read this this article. I hope this responds a little bit to your question for now. Yeah, she, she smiles. <laughs> okay, that's good. <laughs> In an affirmative way. Um, mm -hmm. uh, we have another uh, question by Georgie. Georgie uh -huh. Hello, can you hear me? Great. Well, uh, first of all, thank you very much. It was very interesting, Isabel. I wanted to, not really a question, but I just wanted to comment on Maxim's question, which I find uh, very, very pertinent and uh, relevant about Marxist ontology. It's a, it's a very legit question, really. Um, and I would also like to highlight the importance of uh, Isabel's uh, focus on, or in the introduction of Lukács. Yeah. There is a difference yeah. there, and, sorry? Yeah, I just uh, heard something. I think uh, when Ilyenkov talks about all this, um, the um, identity between the theory of knowledge, uh, dialectics, etc., and talks about how he can kind of continues Lenin's work, 
there are major differences between Lenin's materialism and Ilyenko. And uh, Lukács can actually serve to illustrate that difference because if in Lenin we have this kind of, you know, the matter is the objective reality outside of individual consciousness and we kind of subjectively reflect it and so on and so forth. Uh, and practice in um, Lenin kind of serves only as a criteria for truth. Like you can verify uh, those reflections by practice. While in Lukács, and I, I also think in Ilenko, we have this uh, practice which is generative, right? It's a, a generative of ideas. And epistemology, both epistemology and ontology, or gnosiology and ontology, are kind of sublated into human practice, I think, in Lukács and also uh, in Ilenko. And that's a, a very important point because it has a lot of implications. And I think the abstract and the concrete is also kind of uh, inscribing in that line because the abstract, as you very well mentioned, is the um, is this a sort of an isolation of a specific element. While on your grounds, uh, sorry, uh, for instance, in Marx, it would be the commodity, right? Kind of trying to develop a uh, dialectical. Uh, um, deployment of uh, arguments and then the concrete is kind of putting this commodity back into uh, real relations so both epistemology and ontology kind of come together in this essence from the abstract of the anyway yeah that was my comment i just wanted to highlight the the important because also it kind of echoes my my presentation of tomorrow but thank you very much really um, i enjoyed it a lot thank you thank you very much georgie yeah i think it's um it's nice that you picked up on uh, Lukács because we really try to embed Ilyenko's argument in this triangle of Hegel, Lenin, and Lukács as these very three important, quite different um, positions or interlocutors of Ilyenko at the time he was writing this paper. And um, I think it's generally a very interesting time for Soviet philosophy because suddenly you have these books emerging like the young Hegel and this Russian translation or at least part translation which we also analyze in the paper of a very particular um, part from the Hegel book and what we also argue is there is a direct reaction to Lenin's philosophical notebooks as well um, and Maybe what Corinna was talking before, uh, the relation between consciousness and um, the material reality or consciousness and being already following a dialectical logic in Marx, which maybe is overshadowed by, by Leninist reading and Yankov's attempt to actually rectify this reading of Marx or trying to add to it or trying to um, make it more complex. Um... We have another question from the. It, it seems like uh, Maxim wants to return and. Okay, uh, Maxim, uh, you, you, you can uh, you can come back to to the point you wanted to, to make about uh, the connection of uh, Yelianko to to Lenin, I think. The relation to sorry to um yeah to. Um, that was a, a short answer to uh, Georgi's co uh, comment. There's not a question. Okay, okay, all right. Um, then I I would like to uh, raise a question or or rather uh, ask you to maybe elaborate a little bit uh, about the historical context of this paper, as you already pointed out, uh, and also Corinna mentioned we did not have any uh, translation up until now. So um, it's quite interesting then to look at the historical background. And you did this, for example, with the hard translation of Young Hegel, which was uh, discontinued because it was clear, I think, maybe also because that's an open question of historical circumstances. Uh, the Hungarian uh, uprising in 56 it became quite obvious that uh, the translation will not happen, right? So um, this would be a quite interesting to um, elaborate maybe on, on the historical context of this very first, uh, at least to my knowledge, it's the, it's the very first uh, publication of Yelienkov, also in comparison with his later, right? Uh, um, so also in terms, not only in historical terms, but also in systematic terms, uh, was the immediate outcome where there are immediate reactions uh, maybe to the paper and so on maybe you can say something about that yeah 
Sure. Um, so what, what we cover and what we also like sketch out as the background of these arguments is in 1955-1956, Iyankov immediately had to undergo some interrogations by the uh, party. And we can already see here that what he writes in this article already put him at odds with like um, orthodox doctrines of materialism. And again, what we what we try to highlight is the similarity to Lukács, how actually both occupy a certain territory of dissent, then again, trying to appease and, and um, actually developing theories which bring them far away from like accepted orthodox opinions. Um, on the other hand, what we have in the 50s as well uh, is an opening or this idea of like the, the Soviet thaw and actually an influx of also resources like the Lukács book for a brief period of time. And um, I think it's very interesting that this essay appears in, in this basically on the backdrop of these double events. So on the one hand, uh, a looming closure, on the other hand, a moment of quite uh, open discourse and also influx of resources. And um, what else could I say about this? And what we also um, considered important is the first Russian translation, 56, or so the year after this article appears, of Marx's economic and philosophic manuscripts of 1844. And I think it would be also worth to to look at this in, in close how how this might might have shaped the Yankov's further trajectory after this first big work. Mm -hmm. Thanks, uh, Kirill also wants to ask something. Yeah, I'm interested. So I I, I had another. I say I'll, I'll even sort of shut. Um, I I'd never heard um, of. This essay. I'm, I'm interested about the word science in that um, title. So I, I, I read um, Dialectics of Abstract and Concrete and Marxist Capital in many ways as a book which is about philosophy of science, um, which are interesting. But, but whereas at the same time, you're really drawing attention to the influence of Lukash, who for me, um, the young Lukash, at least in terms of the way that he's been. Um, picked up. He's moving in a very different direction to the one that Dilienkov moves in, in that it's kind of a, a bracketing off of science. It's very much wanting to focus on, um, well, I don't know, to, to me it seems like it's a focus on consciousness in a, and a social totality, which isn't particularly capturing the kind of um, dialectic that I think um, Karina was talking about. Uh, I, and for me, I, I, I'd kind of be interested about the, the tension between Lukash, or maybe it's a different aspect of Lukash that he's drawing on, and uh, the kind of thoughts that uh, Ilyenko has about, um, the, I guess, the, the project of science, as well as um, the idea of materialism. Thank you. Um, maybe I focus on the second part of your question, because uh, I'm not sure I will be able to like say exactly the difference what Lukács or how Lukács and Iyankov developed in different directions philosophically. But what I can say is that there's a certain um, premise Iyankov has in this essay, which is concrete truth is the same as scientific knowledge. And he doesn't explain it, how he means that, but he just uh, states it and, and then develops this idea further that what he describes when he describes the the ascent from the abstract to the concrete is basically the development of scientific truth. And I think it's very interesting. It's also a notion of science, which is interesting, I think, to reintroduce today into like discourses around the philosophy of science, because I think the very notion um, that Iyankov has in mind is, is quite rich and also might respond to interesting ideas around um, materiality which I think is relevant for today's philosophy of science as well, his, his contribution. Um, it's just um, a first impression. I'm not entirely sure. I think it would be interesting to read this article again as um, maybe from the, philosophy, from the perspective of philosophy of science. I think it's a good idea. 
Yeah, I, I agree. I think uh, what's in there, you already mentioned actually in, in, your, in the beginning that it's quite a Hegelian uh, conception underlying the whole uh, article, right? And uh, this also pertains to the very concept of science or scientific knowledge. And Jacob uh, must have been conscious about this uh, because, um, of course, part of his work was to counter positive. And we, we find this kind of uh, struggle with positivism also in other Hegelian inspired uh, theories, critical theory and early pragmatism. It's always quite interesting to see that a totally different kind of understanding of the logical inquiry or scientific uh, truth uh, develops from, from that. And yeah, I agree quite interesting here today. David had a question. Yeah, can you hear me okay? Can you hear me okay? No. No. Okay. Yeah. Uh, one second. Oh, I can come to the. Yeah. So we need a. Uh, yeah. Okay. Hi. So, can you hear David and Oscar? Uh, not yet. No. Uh, just working stay on the next screen. to Q. Um, okay. Can you hear me now? All right. Can you, can you, can you hear me? No. Yes. Yes. Yes, yeah. you can hear me. Okay, I can great. hear you. So I just wanted to say um, uh, that, I mean, this is a very important uh, article, first publication. Um, and I think uh, Kirill is right that you know, one of the most important things at stake is the nature of scientific thinking in this early work. And, um, and indeed, in all of Ilyenkov's writings about the abstract and the concrete, the central issue is what is scientific knowledge? Um, and that's really why it's uh, a subversive work, because um, uh, it represents a critique of empiricism, of reductionism, of scientism, um, and Ilyenkov kind of perceives these uh, currents at work in Soviet uh, intellectual culture, and he's always trying to sort of root them out, and this goes right back to his early work. So the article um, uh, was, I mean, it's a sort of an expression of his candidate's dissertation, which was on the same theme, written, finished, I think, in 1953, I think. So then he gets this first publication out of, of that. Um, and then he attempts to write, um, well, he writes the manuscript, which um, became the dialectics of the abstract and concrete in Marx's capital. But, uh, I mean, you may know all of this prehistory, so forgive me for just bringing it out, but, but um, the, I just wanted to stress that the sort of political controversy was not just over the influence of Lukács, um, but also um, this, uh, the book version that came out of this work, um, had all kinds of problems because Ilyenkov, um, in retrospect, foolishly gave the manuscript to um, an Italian publisher um, in the hope it would be uh, published abroad. I mean, this was sort of in the spirit of the Thor and, uh, you know, um, also the Italians were very present in Moscow. Yes. Uh, 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 anyway, the publisher was Feltrelli that. <coughs> Turned out to also be publishing Dr. Girarda at the time, which was a catastrophe um, to be associated with this publication. Got quite a, all kinds of problems over this. This was the second major crisis, um, the first being over the theses on the nature of philosophy. This was the second one. And so it looked like that book would never see the light of day. And it, when it did see the light of day, um, it was massively censored, cut, 
So the version we have in translation of the dialect is the Azra and the Concrete Mart is a translation of a redaction, um, which was then published in full, I think, in 97. And its title, <laughs> the real title, is The Dialectics of the Abstract of the Concrete in Scientific Theoretical Thinking. So this just goes back to the fact that what this is really all about is the nature of scientific thinking as the quest for concrete knowledge, if you like, or knowledge of reality as a, in its concrete particularity, which you only arrive at via um, the deployment of abstraction in the best sense and to the best ends. Okay, that's that's just a comment. I mean, I'm really looking forward to reading your paper in Sasha's book and the article in translation. Exciting. Thank you for doing that. Thank you, David, for the for these um, commentaries. I think very important ones. Um, the idea of science, um, but also that you point to, to the transnational nature which Ilyenkov's work has from early on, and I think it also shares. I mean, with, with other like Kare, we can think of Kare Kosik's contemporary works on on, dia on dialectics and on, on concreteness. And it's interesting that, that these works back in the 70s had this global reception and before they were forgotten. And I think that in these networks, it would be worth to research this more. So how was Ilyenko's work transmitted from early on? And um, I can just point to, now I can use my excuse. excuse. Actually, my co-author wrote a paper on the Italian affair as well of, of Ilyenkov, which is soon to, to, I think, next year to be published. And um, maybe the last thing regarding the scientific discourse which Ilyenkov opens, which I think is really interesting that you all bring this up, is what I found particularly striking is the subtlety in this early work with which Ilyenkov describes how concreteness is really not sensuous experience how we have to think about it in an entirely different angle and um, how we have to think about material interconnectedness from from a different point of view and I think this is what makes this um, article very rich and very it's short but very very dense and interesting and maybe the last thing uh, about the translation which is again um, something Trevor did really great work on in trying to to also contemporarize Ilyenkov in a way, trying to look at this language from the 50s um, and, and bring, yeah, bring the article into to a contemporary readership. And I'm, once it's published, I'm really looking forward also reading feedbacks on the translation. And um, we use a lot of Russian terms as well, trying to like in brackets. So maybe we can speak about, about it another day. Yeah. Thanks, uh, first of all, Isabel, for your presentation and your contribution in the book, of course. Now, yeah. Thank you, everyone, for the questions. So, uh,